everybody and welcome to episode number nine, number nine, of the Let's Learn Awake guitar series. Now I am genuinely shocked that we have made it this far, but here we are. Now usually I'll have something funny to say that has absolutely no bearing on the reality of the situation at the beginning of these videos. However, today, judging by the lyrics of this song, I think John Myung is a little too sad for us to be making jokes, alright? But that's not going to stop us from covering every single note, every single time change, and every single chord progression with a full, detailed musical analysis of Lifting Shadows Off a Dream by Dream Theater. Let's get it. Lifting Shadows Off a Dream is the ninth song on Dream Theater's Awake album, and it's another ballad. A little fancier than the previous ballad, though. Whereas The Silent Man was a bit of a small ballad, this is a large ballad with a lot more interesting things going on and, uh, frankly, a lot more character as well. One of the defining characteristics of this song is the bass intro. Check this out real quick. John Myung is just outlining specific notes of the two chords being played. For the B minor, he's hitting E, the 11th, and B, the root. Okay, so 4 to 1. And on the G, outlining the Lydian, sharp 4 to 5, root, and the major 7. So a lot of dissonance occurring within that that gives it a very mystical sound. Now John Petrucci joins in with his own natural harmonics after the bass goes two times through, just like this. 7th fret, 12th fret, again, then 5-5-7, five, five, all natural harmonics, right? 11, root, root, and then that minor second dissonance on top, just like in the bass line. Now the major difference between the guitar part and the bass part is that the guitar has a delay effect on it, a very specific delay effect. It's an eighth note triplet at 108 beats per minute on a tap delay, okay? Now this is basically like a delay sequencer, so it's super accurate with the timing as long as you put the BPM in, and uh, that's what's happening throughout most of the song. There's a lot of this delay effect, also known as the edge effect, um, colloquially speaking. After the guitar and bass play that harmonic riff two more times, the keyboards enter with a single note synth line. And we all know how much Kevin Moore loves single note synth lines, especially if you've been following this series. Check it out. Technically speaking, Moore is just outlining the flat third, the root, and the flat seventh and other parts of the scale as well, but it's a very pentatonic sound. It sounds very, very, very pastoral, almost as if there's a brush stroke involved. It's like if you have a painting and you can see the brush strokes, that's almost like what this is with this line. And it also reminds me of Japan Noir. Now, nobody really knows what that is because I just made it up right now, but Japan Noir means dark Japan. So imagine being out in the middle of a, uh, a meadow, a Japanese meadow in the nighttime with smog machines. Think about it, Japan Noir. For the next part of the intro, the keyboards vary up the melody a little bit, and now we're outlining the fifth note of the B minor and the G instead of the root. Now, also what's happening is we are no longer in a pentatonic mode, okay? Because we have introduced half steps. We are now moving further west on our conquest. <laughs> This melodic change also comes a change in the guitar part. Now, the eighth note delay really starts going crazy at this point because we are playing eighth notes. So we're creating a sixteenth note rhythm chopping up into a sequence. So this is what it sounds like without the eighth note delay. B11 to a G6 and 9. That's a G69. Oh yeah. And then an A sus 2 at the end. 
Did I mention how much these guys love 6-9 chords? They just can't keep their hands off of it. 69. Really, guys? Pathetic. And also, I must add that after playing the same chord progression 11 times throughout this intro, the last time it changes. Instead of going to a G, we go to an A chord to set up the verse part. With verse 1 comes a completely new chord progression and a unique section to the song. Let's start with Kevin Moore's keyboard part right out of the gate. Now this whole quarter note rhythm and octave jump in the bass line is very reminiscent of Pink Floyd's The Wall. If you've never heard Empty Spaces before, go and check that out and tell me it doesn't sound almost exactly like it. Just another point that proves that Kevin Moore was in an extremely dark place during this period of time. He's starting off with a four chord progression, B minor, G, B minor over F sharp, and E5 all on top of a B octave jump in the bass and you can hear that in the isolated track now what's going on here is B minor which is the one G which is the flat six B minor again over an F sharp and then E5 so a lot of tension being placed being emphasized here the chord voicings he's using also change as few notes as possible the lower voice moves around when the high voice the high B stays static the entire time which is a very intelligent way to move through a series of chords without making it seem like you're getting pulled around or yanked around too much now the guitar enters and we are really utilizing that edge style guitar effect with the 16th note rhythm. It's a dotted eighth at 108 beats per minute, remember that. And basically we're creating a pattern that almost sounds like an arpeggiator, like a keyboard arpeggio but on the guitar instead. So this is what it sounds like without the delay effect. We're going B sus2 to B minor over a G, which is G major 7, B sus2, E5. It comes around again. B sus2, G major 7, F sharp, sus4, but really it's a B sus2 and then the E5 again. So just another way of getting through the same exact chords, but using a very interesting effect. And in this case, I will say it is very interesting. That edge effect can get really old really fast, but here it doesn't. I must also note that you need to play these guitar notes as straight as possible. Boring, super boring, and kind of comically boring, like this. Right? Like you're hopping up and down on a potato. Just like this. And you want to exaggerate it almost, to the point where it just feels silly. And that will ensure that the delay effect will trigger properly and give you the right sound. Now here's what it sounds like with the delay effect on. Chorus 1 continues all the same elements as verse 1. The delay guitar, the keyboard with the quarter note, and whole notes on the bass. The chords being played are a B minor over D, so a nice low D on the bottom, first inversion, an E5, so no quality to the 4 chord, but I think it's a minor 4 chord, and then a G, flat 6, and an A chord, flat 7. Now, the interesting thing about what Kevin Moore does compositionally here is that B pedal continues through every single chord up until the very last one when it hits the A. Petrucci handles this section very similarly to the first verse, but we're using some different patterns. So we have the B minor pattern here, right, on top of a D, and then this. That looks like a sus4 pattern, right? But it's actually an E minor 9 because that's the root note on the bottom. We then head up to a G like this, G5, power chord, and then major 7, which is perfectly allowable on the 4 chord or the flat 6 chord, up to this. Now that's an A sus4, and that's what the whole thing is. Now Kevin Moore doesn't play an A sus4, but Petrucci does, which I think... Uh, creates a major seven dissonance between the two members of the band. <laughs> they really weren't getting along, were they? <laughs> 
And of course, the last two chords, the G and the A major, can now be seen as the 4 and the 5 chord to D major, because that's exactly the key that the chorus section is in. Chorus 1 is the first section of the song that introduces the acoustic guitar, and it plays a part that sounds like this. A D major, open D, to a G with that rhythm, 1 to 4, D to G twice, then B minor, A sus 4, G and 9, and then an E minor at the end. So that's a 6 chord, 5, 4, and 2 to cap it off, which then goes right back to B minor. On top of the acoustic guitar, the edge, I mean John Petrucci, continues that delay effect with the dotted eighth note, playing this. Four times. That little line just outlines the fifth, fourth, third, and the second scale degree moving down to the root. So it's just D major scale moving down from five. Now on the other chords, it creates some very interesting colors. On the G, it's a nine, a one, a major seven, and a six. Okay? On the B minor, it's a flat seven, a flat six, a five, and an eleven. On the A, it's a root, flat seven, a major six, and the five. And on the E minor, it's eleven, flat third, nine, root. So a lot of interesting colors when you just play the same ostinato riff on top of a moving chord progression. Sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? Now, Kevin Moore further supports this section with a massive synth string sound with a lot of high gain and it sounds like there's almost distortion on it, and an organ. So this also introduces the organ as well. So check this out with everything playing together. After chorus one, we hit the re-intro section, which starts off relatively similarly to the first part, except John Petrucci is playing a completely different part than what was being played before. Kevin Moore is playing the same synth line with the melody notes unchanged, and the chords remain the same-ish. Let's see if we can spot the difference. So we can think of this as the last four times through the intro, going through this first part, B minor to G three times, and then an A at the very end. Okay, so that's a very distinct difference from the first part. Now here's what Petrucci is doing without the delay effect on that first part. Check it out. <laughs> That's just a straight up A major chord at the end. So we're hitting a B minor with a ninth. All right, so one, five, one, two, three. And then G with a ninth and the sharp 11th outlined at the top. So very colorful chord. You do that three times in a row, and then we do this, the same B minor nine, and then an A major chord, just straight up. Now remember that Kevin Moore is still just playing his same exact melody line on top of all this, but this is where things get really crazy, okay? So I want you to listen to this last section, and you're going to see what happens. Check it out. major chord we really start opening up Pandora's box with these chord voicings here. So we handle the E minor like this, C Lydian, B 
B minor 9, G Lydian, C Lydian again, A sus 4, G add 9 with this major 7, E minor 9, and that ends the entire thing. Let's unpack this chord progression. Starting off with E minor as the 4 chord or the new 1, the C chord as a flat 2 or the flat 6 to the E minor. This A sus4, which could be, I mean, it can either be seen as the 4 chord to the E minor or some weird flat 7 to the B. And then G, which pivots back to B minor, because this is clearly the flat 6 to the B minor. And E minor then becomes the 4 chord definitively at the very end of it. So it's very interesting how you could play around with just one chord that's different and change the whole thing around. I must also reinforce the idea that Kevin Moore's melody remains unchanged. The only thing that changes it is the harmonic value that's given by the rest of the members of the band. Those chord changes add to an entirely different melodic dimension up top that Kevin Moore is playing. That F sharp turns from being the fifth of the B minor chord to now the sharp four of the C chord. So that's pretty incredible how they utilize that type of tension and resolution. Verse 2 is layered up with four different components. A slightly more busy bass line that sounds like this. A signature Kevin Moore single note synth line, which sounds like this. and a very heavy, high-gain electric guitar part that's reminiscent of that same B minor to G, E minor to C progression, which goes like this. B sus 2, which is the one chord, two bars. G, the flat six chord, same deal. Then we hit E, two, three. And then C sus 2, which is the flat six to the E minor but also the flat 2 Neapolitan chord to the B minor, and that goes around to repeat twice. The acoustic is layered underneath with the same exact chord progression, but with slightly different voicings. And you'll notice how the rhythm is more of an eighth note pattern going throughout, just like this. To the G add 9, looking like that. E sus 4 to E major. So it's a major four. And then that C Lydian to A. Now let's put all those elements together in a beautiful, flourishing verse two progression. Pre-chorus 2 is the exact same section as pre-chorus 1, but the guitar has a little bit more dirt added to it, and the other members of the band are playing with a little more vigor to support the added dynamic value. Now, pre-chorus 2 is acting as a crescendo into a slightly louder chorus 2, alright? So we're building dynamic as we move with this song. Chorus 2 follows suit with pre-chorus 2 in that the dynamic is elevated slightly from the first chorus. Now the only thing that's really different is that the acoustic guitar is slightly more busy during this section. The electric guitar is playing the exact same part but with slightly more gain and Kevin Moore is doing the exact same thing with his synth strings and organ part. But here's the acoustic guitar. a few extra notes. And that E minor is on the downbeat, by the way, whereas the rest of the chords are on an upbeat. So just keep that in mind here. The 
The section immediately following chorus two we can consider to be a bridge section. Now this bridge happens two times in the song with a slightly different function for each one. This one acts as a setup to the next instrumental break which we'll get to in a few moments. For now let's just check out the chord progression that's going on underneath. There's the bass playing eighth notes, the acoustic guitar strumming just basically whole notes, and uh, through a very specific progression. G, two, three, four, G, three, four, A, two, three, four. So this is four and five, or flat six, flat seven, and then G over B, so an inverted flat six chord, to an A over C sharp. So this is where John Myung plays a very important role in the harmonic function. The bass line is ascending from G up the D major scale, G, A, B, C sharp, inverting the two chords that are progressing as we move along. Petrucci continues with his uh, annoying delay effect going like this, a very Rush inspired part. crescendo at the end. Ready? Listen for the crescendo. We're gonna get loud. Oh! You gotta play it a little louder toward the end there. Make sure you do that. Now James Labrie has a very important contribution as well. He is starting in the low register and she listens and then moving into the middle register. Oh, and she listens openly this will become pertinent later on, so stick around. The next section brings about the first instrumental break of the song. Now, this is probably the first actual dream theater section, right? See how I put that in quotes? Because we're actually moving around, we're playing fancy stuff, odd time signatures as well, and uh, Petrucci is finally on the high gain channel just playing a riff for once. So no delay effect here, just uh, classic DT. <laughs> So like I was saying, we are playing a single note line that Kevin Moore doubles. Now John Myung's role is a little bit different, we'll get there after this. Um, so we're playing on a B sus4 to B minor progression, so the whole first part is over a B minor. All on the second fret and then resolving to the fifth fret, and then right on the time change, that's the seventh beat of that measure, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, and that's downbeat number one for the measure of 9-8, all right? Now you can think about 7-8 as being 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3. Measure of 9-8 can be seen as 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then we're into the next section, which is actually over an E7. So we've gone from B minor to E7, but it's a very interesting way of utilizing an E7. It's more of a flat 9 type of experience, a Phrygian dominant, if we'd say, with the flat 9 and the major 3rd. Just like that. So we're actually modulating into the key of A minor at this moment. Once again, there's that 7-8 measure ending right at that 2nd fret. Now on the 2nd fret, that's where the first downbeat of a 4-4 measure is. So we're actually sandwiching a measure of 4-4 between 7-8 and 9-8 to elongate it just a little bit further for this uh, particular part. So, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1. through that progression. Now, we're staying on E until the very last moment. When we hit the third fret of the D string, 
That's an F Lydian. If you notice this, that's an F power chord, and there's the sharp fourth. So just a little food for thought. And my young actually colors that in on the bass line too. Now we hop to the same exact riff, but instead we're in A minor and up in a higher register. So two, 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 three, five. All the same stuff too. Now on that B string, you want to really give it a lot of vibrato right before you come into this part. The next part is the same lick that we played on top of the E7 with the flat 9, but this time it's a D7 with a flat 9, okay? Add those 16ths in there. Ascend while keeping that D pedal on the bottom throughout those particular spots. Now there's nothing much to say about that except the uh, the notes outline the flat nine, the flat seven, the root, the sus four, and the major third. So we could just see this as a sus four to major third resolution. Nothing to see here. The last thing I'll say about this instrumental break is that the quarter note accents that John Myung and Mike Portnoy lay down give us a feeling of familiarity. It makes us feel like we are in a normal song, you know, while uh, Dream Theater is clearly not playing a normal song, but it makes us feel as if we're living in an illusion. On the 7-8 measure, John Myung is playing the riff along with the other members of the band, but as soon as it hits that measure of 9-8, he's stomping on a hard quarter note on a B, on the root note. We then continue to do the same thing, we just elongate it a little bit further. Do 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 bump 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 and then right at the end John Myung plays an F to signify that chord change which is actually the flat six of the A minor so we're going from five to flat six within that key going on a little further everything seems to be basically the same for this next part do 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 bump Bom, 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 ba. This last part is where things change a little bit. Um, the feel is now in a straight 4-4 four, four, all the way through. Now the time signatures and the riff is exactly the same, but we're outlining different notes. So dun 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 two three four one two three four five. So the way that the drums and bass are handling this makes it feel like two measures of four and a measure of five, which equate to the exact amount of beats that we need to get through that riff anyway. So hey, doesn't really matter, just a little change. And it's actually a simpler way of getting through it as well. It makes it feel like a more down-to-earth band than uh, Dream Theater actually is. <laughs> After that instrumental break, we come into the guitar solo. It's not much of a solo by Petrucci's standards, but maybe if this were a Blink-182 album, this would be considered a masterpiece solo. Let's check it out. This lead is being played on top of Kevin Moore's strings and organ. D major is the first chord. That's our major one. However, that doesn't last very long. We're mode mixing D minor into this whole thing. B flat is the next one. So that's the flat six. G and nine, which I believe we're gonna call a minor four. And then the F, which is the flat third, to a C, which is the flat seven, which is gonna lead right back to our root note again. Big one, okay? The guitar handles this by landing on the major third of the D chord, okay? So that makes perfect sense. Three, and then coming to F natural instead on the B flat. Now the F natural on the B flat is a 
perfect fifth coming down to the E, which is the sharp four, so that's Lydian. Now when we hit the D, we're on top of a G chord. That is also the perfect fifth. And we come way up to here to A, which is the ninth of the G, the major third of the F, and the six of the C. So this is just a nice little melodic line that happens to play nicely with all three of those chords. The second time we come around to repeat the same thing, major third, perfect fifth, perfect fifth, and then we just hit the A down an octave with a nice big diver right down at the end. So that guitar solo is just meant to transition us back into a verse, a third verse, which is based on this exact same chord progression, D, B flat, G minor, F, C. So we have a slightly gritty electric guitar playing this rhythm in unison with a 12 string. And I'll bring out the 12 string in a little bit, don't worry. I told you I was going to come back with a 12 string. Now let's play this riff. So doesn't that sound beautiful? We're starting off with this D5 voicing to represent the D major. Open D and A string, second and third fret of the G and B respectively, just doing that little back and forth. And then coming to a B flat in this voicing. Now, I would suggest using your middle and your pinky to hold the second and third fret so you can move around with the bass notes. You got B flat on this one, B flat and D. So that makes a B flat major chord, but we have an A which is the major seven. So that's B flat major seven, the flat six. We then hit it to this, G and nine. Then we hop in like this with F and nine, because you're playing an F in the bass and a G, an open G on top, and then a C in the bass and the same note. That would be the perfect fifth of the flat seventh chord. Great way of handling those two chords. The only other difference is the second time around, Instead of doing an F to a C, we do F, open G, and then open E, which inverts the C chord into first inversion. It's still a flat seventh chord, though. Let's listen to the 12 string and the gritty guitar played together for this part. The second bridge is the same as the first, but it comes back with a vengeance. It's much louder and the dynamic is just through the roof. So we have a little bit more grit on the guitar and we're utilizing the open G string and a movable line on the D string to get that, uh, that Rush inspired riff out. Instead of going like this, with the delay effect, the delay is off, we go like this. very last one we go like this we scale up the D major scale with the G still ringing out over the top of it all the chords are exactly the same as well John Myung still thumping with the eighth note bass going up G A B C sharp but this time we resolve into D major so these are all fours and fives four and five chords through the whole thing that same Lydian idea important thing I must add, remember when I was talking about dynamics and progressing the song? They are a progressive rock band after all, we have to progress the song, that's the entire idea. James Labrie comes in with the kill here. He starts off with a middle register vocal. And she listens openly. And then gets up to the high vocal to make a massive peak. Now this is great because the first bridge, we start off in a low register and then we go into a middle register. This bridge, we're starting in the middle register and then we're going up to the high register. It's pretty awesome. 
Don't take the simple things for granted. Chorus 3 has the exact same chord progression as the other ones before. D to G, D to G, B minor, A, G, E minor. Okay, but it repeats twice and we have a tag at the end of it as well. The only difference here, aside from it being louder, is the guitar is playing a distorted version of that descending line without delay either. Alright? And we're on the G string playing this line. We do it four times across all of the chords. So that's 14th fret. 12, 11, 12, slide, and then come all the way down. And that's all pedaling on D, which gives us a nice basis for all the chords to roll under. Now for this last chorus, the acoustic is the hero of the day. We actually come in with a 16th note strum, so we're going all out with the right hand here. Now the cool thing about this is that the acoustic guitar is picking up where the electric guitar left off beforehand. If you remember from the first two choruses, we have the electric guitar playing that delay affected riff, right? Giving us that 16th note pattern. Well now, guess what? The acoustic guitar is playing the 16th notes instead, so it's picking up where that left off. Very cool. <laughs> Chorus 3 also has a tag um, where the rhythm is slightly affected in the acoustic going like this. A straight 16th, right, all the way through with the same chords. Much straighter than it was before. So on top of that previous acoustic part, during the chorus tag, the electric is playing these chord voicings on top, which is more like this. At the 7th and the 10th fret, playing D to G. Now for the B minor, we're playing that voicing, which is 7-10, which is the minor 3rd and the flat at 7th, and the root note B on top, a very interesting uh, choice of voicing. And then we come back down to here, stay on this, and then for the E minor we hit this. So that adds a lot of color to that E minor chord. We're already playing a D and a D, which is the flatted seventh, and a G, which is the minor third. But to make it better, we actually come into the F sharp, which is the ninth. So we're turning this into an E minor nine chord. Very cool. important note about this Chorus 3 tag is that it drives the point home that this song is indeed called Lifting Shadows Off a Dream. As we know, it's the only words that James Labrie can speak during this point of the song. We've run out of ideas other than that, so it's just Lifting Shadows Off a Dream, Lifting Shadows Off a Dream, that's all we get. Now, there's an interesting part within the harmony layers that are going on. James Labrie is singing two different harmonies below and on top of himself. Lifting shadows off a dream. We have this first line. Lifting shadows off a dream. So we're holding out that high A, which would be the fifth of the D chord and the ninth of the G chord. Now, check this out. On the lower part, he's singing Lifting shadows off a dream When he moves up that half step, the A remains static, so basically what's happening is we're crunching in a major second. 
that's pretty incredible. We're going from a minor third harmony, which is normal, to a major second harmony, and adding a little vibrato on top of it as well, but holding it out for the rest of the measure. That's pretty crazy. That's not something that's usually done. The outro just consists of a breakdown back into the intro. So we have the bass line, the bass riff with the harmonics, the guitar harmonics, and of course Kevin Moore's single note synth line. It continues to break down even further beyond that with just the keys and the bass playing for the very outro. John Myung is playing the exact same bass line as he was before, but Kevin Moore is going back to the stylings of verse 1. He's playing those quarter note chords, but just between B minor and G. With that same B octave jump in the bass line. That progression runs through four times, and then we hit a retardando. Uh-oh, better not get my channel banned after saying that. <laughs> but a retardando at the very end. And then G, G, G. All right, so we actually end on the flat six chord, which sort of gives us a sense of foreboding, like it's not over yet, or it's not supposed to be over, but it is over. Ending on any chord but a one is going to leave you with that feeling. It's going to leave you incomplete. But in this case, it leaves you incomplete in one of the best ways possible. Alright everybody, thanks so much for coming along this journey with me through lifting shadows off a dream. Next up is going to be Scarred. We only have two songs left here, people, and I can't believe it. But uh, we're going to keep on rolling through this. We're going to keep nailing down these notes, these time changes, this theory, the analytical side of music that everybody's hungering for. We're craving it. If you would like to further support the channel to keep this hunger moving, the desire can be fulfilled. Go to www.subscribestar.com slash Romanova Music and you can become a monthly patron. You can also go to my PayPal tip jar where you can make a one-time donation if you like what you see. Um, if you don't like what you see, that's fine. Tell your enemies about this and maybe they can come and support the channel. Um, Alright everybody, thanks a lot. Please, keep playing, keep listening, keep understanding the music because it's the most important thing in the world. Goodbye.